Hello and welcome to the SC Playbook Podcast, proudly brought to you by Mortgage Choice SCW. I'm your host, Tim Williams. We've arrived at our year in review podcast, one of my favourite of the season, recapping the good, the bad, the ugly, even the disastrous, <coughs> my rank. Uh, guys, here to do that on today's show, to wrap up 2024 and the year that was 2021's 91st placed finisher, the Spy. Spy, how are you, mate? Ah, g'day, troops. Yeah, pretty uh, topsy-turvy week, actually, in the Spy as well. We've had uh, I was Crook with a head cold, uh, Sambo's grand final yesterday down at Queen Band. Bloody good stuff. Back-to-back mm. -back back for the ruse. Got the snip. Um, yeah, <laughs> money going on. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all went happening, boys and girls. It all went happening. But, I've uh, never met a bloke more open about yeah, getting a no. snip. The funny thing is, right, <laughs> me and two of my brothers, right, not as open as me. Very open about anything, so anyway. But like when people ask me what I've been doing, well, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> what else and am I going to say? For you, mate? You're right. I was actually going to say, genuinely for a reason, I highly recommend it. So if you're, <laughs> shit, if, you, if you're shit scared like I was, just go get it done, boys, if you need to. <laughs> two was enough, mate. Um, two, yeah, two's plenty. Two kids is good. But uh, no, it was all right. Went in, got the bus into town and got, got the business done. And there is a story to follow, but I won't go all into that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, mate, you've given advice for me, not that I've had any children yet, but uh, two pairs of undies the week after. Uh, yeah, I've still got two on now, and the, ca <laughs> the car trip home with you yesterday was not ideal, a bit bouncy. Oh, but, uh, yeah, apart from that, going well. You've caught me off guard there, <laughs> so, I love it, mate. Uh, also with us, uh, a much more tame, 2021's <coughs> sixth-placed finisher, Clementine Cassidy. Clem, how are you? I'm good, thank you. So I've had a great week as well. So I had the Playbook event on Saturday night, which was really fun. Um, up on the Goldie yesterday. So nothing as exciting as a snip. But yeah. up on the Goldie <laughs> yesterday for the Cool and Gatter Gold launch, which will be awesome Ooh. in October. Um, and then, yeah, back up to Brisbane tomorrow. So just came back for the potty, basically. Yeah, enormous. <laughs> what a trooper. That. Yeah, like pre-show, and I was saying... Why don't you just stay out there? Like you're up there, you got to go back two days. And you said for the podcast, I'm like, oh, you're a saint. <laughs> and um, here I was, I was trying to kick you out of your seat. Apologies, mm. you've earned it. This is my seat. <laughs> uh, you're not just a saint, Clem, but you're also famous. I mean, even more famous than <laughs> usual. And it is to do with that Wiles jersey. We did go out to the round 26 Warriors and Sharks clash, and you've gone viral. Yes, well, the great Anton Posser, he made some really amazing signs. He made four signs um, and I got to hold one of them. And I ended up on the Warriors Instagram on their feed and on also on their story, holding up the honk mm. if you're Shawnee sign. Mm. And it was literally a life goal achieved. Like, that was the best moment, one that of the best moments very, in my life. That is very, very cool. I was yeah, very jealous. I was so excited when I saw it. But, yeah, what an absolute epic game. It was. It was a brilliant, brilliant night out. We had fun uh, and, yeah, made the Warriors Instagram. So exciting time. <laughs> Uh, also with us, as always, a bloke who hasn't been limping around the studio leading into the show, <laughs> Matty the Waterboy. Matty, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I, uh, it, wa it wasn't the, the best end of the year for me, Supercoach-wise, but it was the first year I've actually finished. So to win. So, yeah, it was, um, I, I'm, I'm happy to take part in this review show as someone who actually finish the year for once, which is nice. You will have uh, a lot to share in this one, Matty, about yep. being... You're essentially a rookie. You're, you're close enough to rookie. I am you, a rookie. You've played yeah. a bit, but yeah, this year, you said you got through the <laughs> first time, so there'll be like lessons learned for the first time. Uh, but we will get to that. Before we do get stuck into it, a big thank you to all those that turned up to the SC Playbook subscriber catch up on Saturday. Went to a pub in Sydney, had a few beers, had some pizzas, watched some footy, <coughs> watched Guru and uh, his uh, Supercoach draft rival, Stevie Hevener go toe-to-toe -to -toe for the oh. cowboys Doggies clash, which was just outstanding. We had a special guest for the meet-up uh, in Blake, who we'll get to shortly, but he may or may not have won $50,000 over the weekend. Good night, Spy. Bloody good night. It's mm. actually, we obviously had Sambo's GF the next day, so I was driving pretty early, and I'd been a bit crook early in the week, so I couldn't launch as much as I may have hoped mm. to, but still... Five or six beers and it was bloody good stuff yeah. hanging out with the, with the troops. So thank you to all that showed up for that one. Something <coughs> we will look to do again in the future, hopefully pre-season next year, again, end of season, and uh, just get the community together uh, and have a few drinks. Uh, guys, the SC Playbook Unlimited League winner. It was first overall. Blake, coach of Bryce's boys, came for a beer with us Saturday night. Uh, it was exciting to vicariously live through someone doing well in Supercoach this season. He takes home a 1,000 from SC Playbook. $50,000 from News Corp, $6,000 from Beers and Break Evens, 
He won his local league grand final with De La Salle last weekend. Bloody hell. Big weekend, Clem, for, for Blakey Boy. How good is that? Mm. Oh, my God. Good for That's her. epic. That's epic. No. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Some people don't win a grand final in their lives, let alone doing it the same week you win 57 grand. So exciting times. Uh, also, a shout-out to my old colleague <coughs> and boss, Davey Campbell, who stormed home into second overall. He scored like 1,600 this week, Davey. One of the best blokes you'll ever meet. Unfortunately, he's a News Corp employee. He couldn't, uh, couldn't claim the 5K on offer. But nonetheless, incredible year from Davey. Blokes, blokes never been so happy that he didn't win something. Cause, Seriously. Oh, I mean, you can sort of live with not taking the 5K. Mm. It would sting, but 50 is a lot of yeah. money. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, News Corp look after. <coughs> I was going to say Big Davey, Little Davey, Little Mar. Yeah. Uh, Clementine. The SC Playbook Women's Competition winner, run by yourself. Talk to us. Yes, yeah, so we had a really tough competition. There's so many good female players and super coach. Um, and so we called it the Year of the Girls League. Um, and we had Amy come out as winner, and she is the coach. Such? Amy, I don't know if it is such. Ooh. We'll have to look into we'll work that. It out. Yeah, it's a we'll little work mystery. It out. She's hand. one of the OGs. Yeah, she yeah, is. Yeah, but there's so many good female players in the playbook subscribers. Um, so Pong is Pogo Sticks. She's the coach of that <laughs> right. team. Um, so she absolutely smashed it. And so she's going to get $500 donated to the charity of her choice. 500 was it? Bloody from Playbook. Hell. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was 250 <laughs> uh, but, yes. well, Better check the contract. <laughs> yeah, check, check the T's and C's for that one. <laughs> Uh, beautiful. So we don't know exactly who it is just yet, but we'll be able to work it out. We need to work out which Amy it is, but yeah. yeah. Who, whichever Amy it is, she had an unbelievable year, and congratulations to her. Nice. Yeah, Reach out, Amy. Out the girls. Reach out, Amy. We will work that one out, though. Uh, now, today's show, let's get stuck into it. The year in review. How we went, our best trades, our worst trades. Uh, the biggest talking point in what will take up probably the, the major, the majority of the show, reflecting on the lessons we learned. Biggest talking points. I learned a hell of a lot from this season and a lot to ch- touch on there. Uh, we'll go looking at our standout moments. Anyone that we may or may not have added to our never again list. Always an interesting one. See if you come up with any names there. Uh, also look ahead to 2025. Some potential rule changes we wouldn't mind seeing implemented. That is this week's show. We're also going to have one next week, which will be the Supercoach Awards show. So we'll break it up into two weeks. Weeks just to get you give you a little super coach fix through finals marketing 101 well done yes thank you <laughs> uh guys let's just stuck into it spy lead us off how'd you go all right of in the week leading in i was wondering how i was gonna like oh, how does you how do you compare it i was thinking i want to compare it to an nrl side where do we finish on the ladder i sort of think i ended up six in the six thousands I was about 200 to 300 points off the three 4Ks, which is really thought I was going to finish there. But it just. Just quickly, yeah. was this. Is this a spy 101 approach of in the 6,000s when you actually <coughs> finish 6,999th, or are you actually not sure? I was actually 6'4, if you want to know exactly. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm closer to six. Yeah. I'm closer to five than seven. Um, Fair. But either way, I really wanted to get into that three 4K mark. If I would have. I reckon I would have been like, yeah, maybe a fifth, sixth place finish in the NRL, home final, mm. knockout final nonetheless. But I reckon in the six Ks, me personally, where I set my goals, I reckon I've just missed the eight, probably like the Raiders, like just on four and against. <laughs> not a disaster, but just not good enough to be there. If I was to scrape into the eight, not sure whether I deserved it. Some of the decisions I made, so. Needed it, needed a Sunday <coughs> afternoon Round 27, miracle to scrape into yeah, the eight. maybe like a Maju four tries, Sandiago. Mm. Maybe I would have then said I'm in the eight, but it wasn't to be. Um, that's right, we'll get through, through the ins and outs of why, but something did happen. I actually only set myself two goals to start the year, apart from obviously win it all, which is our goal every yes. year. It was to break the curse of Clementine Cassidy. <laughs> Tick, thanks for coming. <laughs> and to dust up Matty Ryan. Tick. You Thanks got Maddie. Coming. Yeah, pretty comfortable in the end, the big fella. So mm. he was loitering around a bit there the last month, but it took them both to school. And, um, you know, maybe I just got to set my targets a bit higher next year. I've, I'm done with them. <laughs> Blake, uh, Blake can have his 50K, but you've knocked off two two big big rivals there. Uh, and thanks for getting another one, mate. You haven't beaten me in about four or five years. What is it? I definitely beat three years ago because I'm 90th. 2021. <laughs> 
which means I'm now beating you two out of four, so we're about equal in the last four years. But last year, or this year? Oh, this year. Yeah. Uh, last year, I don't think so. I can't. No, remember. I didn't last yeah. year. <laughs> nah, nah, no chance. Uh, we'll uh, go back and review the records, but yeah. Clem, talk to us. All right. Well, first of all, congratulations, Spy, on <laughs> Thank finally you. beating me. It's nice to keep things competitive for next year, and I've got you right where I want you. <laughs> um, so <laughs> <laughs> on the beers. <laughs> <laughs> so for my season, I finished. I like to think of it as just outside the top ten k because that sounds so much better than eleven thousandth one hundredth. Um, mm. You can sum up my entire season with cheap pokers and buy round benders. <laughs> like, yeah. My season just went off the rails in round fourteen. I was actually in inside the top uh, 5k in round 13 and like feeling pretty good about myself and then it just literally just went nowhere like all downhill from there um had the same three hookers all year which was cheese braley and danny levi oh. um so yeah basically that sums up my season at least you didn't wait <laughs> wa- uh, waste trades at hookers i suppose that's one thing <laughs> One I probably should have. <laughs> uh, for the Coombe Stallions, it was an absolute disaster. There's no, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Uh, we finished in the 14k territory, by which I mean 14,900 <laughs> and about 99. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so look, we weren't far off the top 13k. Uh, it was a basket case of a year. Very disappointing. My last year was my last year, worst year on record in basically since started playing <coughs> Supercoach properly. That was about 4k. This year, the wheels just fell off, uh, and I have some pretty strong theories on why and a lack of adapting to a few new new uh, rules in the game. We'll get to that very shortly. Uh, really disappointing, though, but I'd love to blame it on injuries and things going wrong, but I don't didn't have too many more than uh, the average super coach, are, so I can't even really point the finger at that. It was just pulled a few wrong reins. Was so. Mad Monday good at least? Oh, we, yeah, we launched. Yep. We yeah, had a full crack. <laughs> he's yeah. got a... No, wipe the tears of the past and hook Rebuilding in. Yeah, it. exactly. Yeah. We're, in a, we're in a transitional phase. <laughs> uh, Maddie, how'd you end up, mate? Yeah, I'm actually I'm quite happy. Like even though I didn't rank very good, I'm I'm happy with my season because I've learnt so much for next year. There's mm. some key things that I definitely uh, didn't consider this year, um, and that I like kind of kick myself that I didn't do because I were like rookie errors. But yeah, like my origin period was just a disaster basically and that was my own fault it wasn't it wasn't because of certain players it was because i you know sometimes i wouldn't look for buyers properly or sometimes i wouldn't put reserves on because i didn't realize (laughs) that was a dagger that was the dagger that was the dagger (laughs) and it was unfortunate that i didn't realize it till i till the third origin round i'm like why is why i didn't think i went that badly but um so that's a big lesson but to be to be honest i didn't really plan for the origin period anyway so that would be a big mm. thing for me next year but, I, but i'm happy with i'm happy with how it went because i'm i'm so excited for next year already yeah and like we can give you a couple but there's no real excuses next year like you no you're now seasoned enough that you can you can maybe point your finger at one or two things but no real excuses there's no excuses next yeah. year they, they, they were the definition of of rookie errors and if i make the same mistake i mean i'm not going to make the <laughs> reserve mistake <laughs> but if i make the mistake of um not looking towards the origin period and buyer period, then well, then that's my own fault. You've so, got, yeah. yeah, no one to blame. All right, let's get stuck into the nitty gritty. So we'll go through a few trades, a few little standout moments. Uh, then we will get into the reflection on the year, what we learned, the, the real good stuff. Uh, but Spy, your best trades for the season. Best trades. So I was chatting here before. It was a weird year in that I didn't make any many trades. I was like, geez, that was good. Like, what a mm. good trade. But I also didn't make many bad ones. Went through last. Oh, there what? There's nothing there. I'm like, oh, what a what a horrific trade. Jeez, I wasted that. Um, it was actually who I traded out was my issue. But in terms of best, was it best trades to start with? Best trades, definitely Scotty Drinkwater round five. Brought him straight in against the Titans. Captain him for 150. Um, and I was looking really good at that point. Um, that's when I was hoping to launch after that, and it just didn't end up happening. But I reckon. The only other one outside of that drinky skipper was probably Blaze Tulungi. I bought him in pretty quickly, played him when he was at fullback all those games, held on to him when a lot sold when he went on that, that run of tries. Interesting. So, <coughs> like, uh, prior to this, Guru and I recorded our what we've done for beers and break It's a bit different to this. We've gone through our trade-by-trades of the season and looked at how that sort of panned out, so just to differ the shows. And we both, like a lot, sold Blaze Tulungi. <coughs> And at that time, I think he got injured, then he got benched, and then Parra had a bye. 
it made sense at the time, especially with the benching. Those, I think, like yourself, that held, because straight after the ball, he came back into the starting team, I think at fullback, went on his run. Mm. You held him through that initial period? Or oh, did no, you trade him like, back in later? No, I held all throughout. Yeah, so you, yeah. Which was the story of what I didn't do the, with the other bikes this year, right? Mm. Like, I didn't show that patience where I was like, they'll come good. Maybe they got a high break even, but class is class. I backed Blaze from the moment I saw him. I'm like, this kid's unbelievable. So I was like, keep him in. Then he went from fullback to the right wing outside Mitchie Moses, scored like four games in a row. I was like, this is awesome. And then I think after Mitchie got hurt, he swung back to the centres. I was like, that'll do me. But yeah, Blaze to Lungy. Bit of, bit of love there for Blaze. But outside of that, there were plenty of solid trade-ins. But that, that was my year, just solid. I kept doing all right stuff without hitting the heights. So, yeah. Mm. Clem. My best trades points wise was undoubtedly Teddy and Ponga um, when I bought them and I think like sometimes I was just holding my whole team together. Um, so yeah, definitely glad I bought those two in. Um, but my actual best trade in my heart is SJ. Definitely <laughs> SJ, bringing him in round 26 oh, for his final game. Um, so stoked I did that. Like it just <clears throat> added something extra, like as if you could add anything extra to that game. But like just standing up on the hill there yeah. and just knowing he scored me 104 points in his last game, like just so epic. So he's going to be my best trade of the season sj is the best trade in like that's iconic to go yeah. out with that <laughs> i yeah. was stoked as <laughs> uh for myself mine was a little about round round six i brought in james schiller at 238k now james schiller not my best trade in of the year <coughs> but it does segue nicely into it so i bought him at 238k i sold him in round 12 for 468k at a 100 230k profit i then bought in tyron wishart at 381k and sold him in round 21 for 646k. That by far and above was my best trade of the season and sort of uh, hang the hat on that one because there wasn't too much else to get excited about. But <clears throat> wish he got me through that. Uh, the buy period, he had dual halfback 5'8". I had Dill Brown as well who had the dual, so was able to swing those. Wish he was just a fantastic, fantastic pickup. A couple others, I got Gussie Crichton at 459k. Most did, but a lot didn't jump on until later, so I got the best out of Gusso. Bought so far long ago in at 339k, siding for 531. <clears throat> Didn't go as big as I'd hoped, but a nice little one. Uh, and then just the other one was probably just starting the year with Hamiso Tabuai Fido, 600k. He was at about 8 or 9% ownership as a pod. Averaged 85 for me across the first like three or four rounds. Then he got injured in round, I think it was like round five, early on in the game for about four points. That hurt because he would have been about 780k after that and at CT Dub, people would have struggled to get him in. So I brought him in for his ton as well. Mm. About a week after your son, we might started, but yeah. I grabbed him for his ton. I'm like, we're on here. And yeah, he got hurt four minutes into the next one and bugger. Yeah, had him from round, round one and it was all looking <coughs> merry and then that injury, but not to worry. And then, yeah, uh, spy worst trade. Oh, sorry, worst trades. Worst trades, just the three. Um, again, nothing overly bad, right? But Dallin... Tene Zalesniak, as we know, no good. Mm. Jumped on, back the Waz in. At, I don't know what round, round seven or eight or something. He was 720K. Round seven. Yeah. <clears throat> um, he offered nothing. He, even when he got chances, he dropped them. It just was not Dallin's year until the very end at Shark Park. So he finished well there. I'll but, jump um, in on you yep. quickly, Spy, but definitely my worst as well, Dallin. And <clears throat> the first five games that he played leading into us trading him in, he'd average, he was averaging about 75 80, hence the price. The Warriors had started okay, but not their best. We were sort of backed him and said, no, no, like they'll bounce back. The form's yep. coming. There were some signs. He went on to score 61 against the Dragons. He scored from memory in like the last minute to get himself he did. 61. Yep, first game only. Then he went 47 25 23 30. <laughs> Before you knew it, he was 460k <coughs> about four or five weeks later. No, it hurt. I sold earlier than you. I jumped off pretty quickly a couple of weeks later, but yeah, lost a bunch of cash. And I do earlier feel like. me, I got rid of him by like round 22 or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do feel like Supercoach is a lot about momentum. Like, mm. well, if you get your momentum halted, it can hurt you a bit. On the flip side, if you make a good trade and you ride it, you can just go off the back of that and just, just roll with it. Um, second one, Blake Braley. Sorry, Jaden Braley. Killed me this year. Brought him in at 380k as my backup hooker. I'm like, this is the trade of the century. Starting, happy days. He was back and fit. He got benched about two weeks later. Like, doesn't matter. I don't actually have to play him. 
the weeks I played him and had to, he actually went back to starting, scored me 30 twice. I'm like, what is going mm. on here? Didn't play him last week because Connor Watson got back, got cleared. He scored like 90. Had to play him this week and he got 44. And to put in perspective, I was like, 44, I'll take that. Whereas before that, he was averaging as a starter, like traditionally 60. So that hurt. Hooker was the biggest drama of the world for me this year. See... I did the same with Braley, and um, even the first week or two they did it, it looked like a master stroke, and he st- scored well for a few weeks, then went to the bench. Yeah. I got away with it because I started the, again, one of my best moves was I started with Reese Robson, who averaged about 60, 61. It was nothing ridiculous, but in a pretty bleak hooking position, because he was so durable and played just about every game, I very rarely had to play Braley, so I got away with that one, whereas you, because you had to alternate, yep. but you had Appy for a lot of the time. No, I had Robson. Out. To around 19. So I'm like, doesn't matter. I've got Blake sitting there. And I'm like, oh, around 19. This is my third one. Uh, I'm like, I'll go JMK, Marshall King. Oh. Love him. One of my favourite players. I'm like, I'll move away from Robson. Could just hold him for the year, but let's let's get on the attack here. <laughs> 19 minutes into it. I was actually in the sheds warming up for the Mighty Ferrets. My first game, stuck into my bag just before we ran out. I'm like, I'll just check what he's on. 19 after 20. Sweet. Like, and then I, I checked WhatsApp. I was like, oh, sport, spy, RIP. I'm like, what has happened? And he'd done his foot. He's out for 10 weeks. Then I got Cook in the week after. Then I sold Cook because I thought I was going to lose his spot. I used like three trades at Hooker that I had never planned to do. And it was just a calamity up top there. That was in the uh, that game of footy, obviously, in the, the pre-snip era, Spy. And that was uh, – <laughs> I wonder if you're like a, a prized cult. Ooh. That just can't quite keep their mind on the on the game. Yeah. Now that you've had the snip, you've been gelded. And yep. some of them come back and become superstar superstar um, horses. So <sighs> – Asking price through the roof. Superstar gelding. So if you pull the boots on next year, you might just find you've picked up an extra five, ten k's an hour of speed, and w- worth giving it a crack. First game I was take a couple of weeks. <laughs> so all eyes. She's to be honest, it adds up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is that it? <laughs> um, in terms of bad trades, yeah, that's all. Clem. All of them. No. Oh. <laughs> um, Ellen, we have. <laughs> yeah, so it all began at the beginning of the season when I started with cheese. No. Um, so I traded in Braley and kept him, so basically I won that one. Um, and then <laughs> <Yeah>. also <laughs> Hammer Hammer might have been your best trade, but Hammer was basically hammering the last nail in my coffin. I used my last boost on Hammer and literally he just went and scored a bunch of 30s and 40s. Like In games that the Dolphins just, won well. Yep. Watching was like the most painful thing ever. I think I was watching with Spy one night and I was like, is he allergic? Why isn't he touching yeah. the ball? Has he been told not to touch the ball? What's happening? Um, so that's definitely one of my worst <laughs> trades. Um, but Nico, bringing Nico in for those final two games, um, trading out trading out Jerome Hughes and having Nico there for oh. those two games, that was a pretty bad trade. But I owned Nico at some bad points, like the three-point three point game against the Panthers. Mm. And, yeah, so I don't think I – yeah, I think I let my heart lead there. Um, and then also not trading out my cheap hookers. Like, mm. that is a big mistake. I so personally think you were being very stubborn on that. You're like, I've got them, I'm keeping them. Do you know what? I think you're right. <laughs> I know I'm right. Because <laughs> that was not tactical. That. I yeah. have no idea what I was thinking, eh? I was just, like, it using trades on, it was. like, every other position except for hooker. Mm. So. No, I don't need them. Very good. For <laughs> the Stallions, Dallin Tennis Lesney, I touched on that one. Spy absolutely <coughs> killed me. Uh, Joey Manu, the curse is well and truly oh, alive. It's like, oh, yeah. <clears throat> I bought him at 842k in round 12, paid up for him. I sold him in round 18 for 624k at a 200k drop. And even then it was like, it was because of injury, he broke his hand. Even if I held him, I'm like, he'll get scores, and he'll get back 700k, whatever. Uh, just disastrous. Then brought him in for the back end of the season. Roosters went, Tim's traded him in. Let's decide to, let's start using all our attack down the left instead of the right like we have all season. And um, last year and the year before, just out of the blue. Yeah, just finds a way to hurt <laughs> me. So uh, I mentioned I'll be some break evens, <clears throat> but look, at least Joey Manu, at least he didn't get hurt in the back end of the year. So the curse is alive, but he's fit and good for finals. So that is the main thing. Uh, and I'll kick us off with other standout moments that may have been good or bad. I don't know if you've jotted anything down, but... Mm-hmm. Don't know if it comes under worse trades or what it might be, but uh, on that Nico Hines theme, Clem, real dagger in my season when he got to over a million dollars and then he had the the game against Penrith where he got injured, only played a handful of minutes. A few people jumped off him then. 
He missed two games in a row off the back of it. Drop price, drop price. And I just went, again, a bit stubborn. I went, no, no, like, this is the bloke who's been the best scorer in Supercoach two years on the trot. And I said, even if there's the price drop, the tons will come and he'll get back up in price. People will buy him back. I'm going to save those trades. He got injured again at bottom at about 690 once he'd plateaued. That, <clears throat> that also coincided pretty well with people going to Jerome Hughes. And I held uh, Nico, and that was just a real, real dagger in my season, despite anything else that stood out uh, in your season. Yeah, Kalen Ponga, round <clears throat> three. When I was talking fullback roulette, and KP, if we cast our mind back to the first two rounds, he was in all sorts. He was struggling to finish games, mm. not from a sense of injury, but he was fading out of games. He was blatantly unfit. He wasn't, he wasn't Kalen Ponga, basically. So he opened the season at 890K, I owned. Let's have a look here. He took a break even of like 180 or something into round three. I'm like, you know what? This is an opportunity. I'm going to put him on ice for a few weeks, trade him out to – I don't know who it was. I think it was – I do know who it was. It was Luttrell who got sin-binned the next night oh, against yes. the Chooks. Um, bearing in mind, Luttrell averaged 90 for the year, so it's not like I went to someone rubbish, but he scored me 30. KP came out and got 86 against Melbourne and but started to look all right. I'm like, oh, no. So I've got the Wiles next week. They were the probably top two defence in the league last year in New Zealand. Break even still sky high. 117. I watched it at the Forry RSL, I think. I think possibly with you. And he just, he was pong. He was back. Mm. But it happened so quickly. In another world, he could have gone 60-50, dropped 200K, would have scooped him up when I, when I wanted him back. He basically dropped 65K, which is not much. Latrell did nothing for two weeks. He got binned maybe both times. And it really just halted me. And I said in another time, Ponga could have gone bang, bang. Trell could have tunned twice. It did not happen. So that that really hurt. I suppose the one thing, I don't know how the rest of it played out for you, Spy, but <clears throat> as you said, 117, 117, 91, in round seven, so not long after you traded him out, 14 in 52 minutes, injured against the Bulldogs, <coughs> missed a big stretch of games. Well. That had to have helped. Funny you say that. Did you get him back? I brought him back. <laughs> oh, but I how did. was that not in worst trades of the year? Because <laughs> I did get his 117 and his 91. Oh, so oh okay. You got him yeah. back basically a week later. So I got 200 points. I bit the bull. I've made a mistake yeah. here. KP's back. He's, he's oh. the best. And I captained him for his 14. Oh dear. That's about when my season went to <laughs> like not not rubbish, but just plateaued me. Round six. I was at Domino's ordering on the phone. True story. <laughs> and I was going around my mate's place. I'm like, went to pick up my Domino's. It was on Nico Hines, who scored 140 later that day. And I was in line, I go, hey guys, checking my pizza ready for pickup. I'm like, oh just a minute, it's you Tom's? It's out the back. I'm like, oh. Oh, let's change it. There's 30 seconds to kick off. I just, oh. That's what my gut says. So if the pizza had been ready <laughs> at Domino's Forestville, I would have got 140 as captain. Pong would have been traded out and momentum would have ensued, but it was not to be. That's the kind of <laughs> nightmares you just need to mental block. Take it out of your memory. And just <laughs> I'd actually on. forgot about it. Oh, I right. forgot about that too. Yeah. And that's, you know, like, like you can tell stories and you add a bit of mayo. You're like, this will sound good. It was genuinely 30 seconds and the pizza was genuinely late and they're never late at Domino's. So. And they were adding mayo to it out the back. It was, the che it was, it was cheeseburger late. pizza with the mayo on. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Clem, anything else that stood out that you want to touch on? Yes, well, my worst moments were definitely the Nico three-point captaincy. So that stung versus the Panthers. I had the Dom Young negative 15. I had Danny Levi for an AE for a stunning 11 points. Mm. Um, <laughs> oh. So plenty of bad moments for me. For my good moments, I actually chose to look outside of Supercoach. So for my good, <laughs> Much for, easier. For my good moments, one of the best moments, I think, for the season for me was being up at Magic Crown oh. and meeting so many legends, like so many, like, Playbook subscribers and just so many cool people up there. Just mm. an epic time. Um, SJ's final game. That was a great moment for me. Like just the fairy tale finish. Oh my god, it was just like the most amazing feeling on the hill. Um, and then just getting to experience so many of the Sydney footy grounds after moving here. Mm. So experiencing yes. Leichhardt, experiencing Brookie, like epic grounds. Like what? What yeah. was the, what was the highlight ground in Sydney that you went to? Um, do you know Ooh. what it was like? Uh, it was standing yeah. there with Maxi Bryden, mad as Tigers fan, and going through all the emotions with him like at that game Tigers versus Manly that was an epic moment yeah. and actually that was my top navigational success of all time mm. I got from Bondi to Leichhardt without getting lost 
and that is great for me. So that's another great moment. Remarkable. <laughs> Went via Blue Bat Stadium in Penrith, but got that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Maddie, yourself, mate, were there any standout trades, ins, outs, whatever it might have been, any moments of the year that stood out? Yeah, there was probably starting with Val was a good one because even though he, he ended up, well, it was a bit of a roller coaster, but he started well, kind of dipped a bit, and then came came good. Did you hold him all year? I had him all year. Yeah, that was so, huge. So that, like he ended up to the top, averaging CT clutch, dub, yeah. with, and played about twenty one or twenty two games. Yeah, that yeah. was huge. So I was stoked with with him. There was one which oh, I was, it was so close to being a good trade. I, when everyone else was getting in other fullbacks, I brought in Dylan Edwards, and when I brought him in, he went like hundred eighty. Mm. Oh, I don't know the scores, but it was high, 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 <clears> and I was like far out. I've I've got an absolute gem here i'm a god but, but, then, <laughs> but then he gets injured but if you cast your mind back he didn't get injured like for four weeks it was like oh he's he's you know he's yeah. in origin he's out for a week blah blah, blah. so I, I held on to him and then he eventually was yes. ruled out for like four weeks and i was like oh this could have been the best person to have on the run home but it wasn't meant to be so that was <laughs> yeah. almost really good but yeah that's the one that springs to mind the most <sighs> yeah. a terrible one though was when mm. i this is laughable, actually. So mm. I, I don't think I started with Morgan Smithies. Well, I, I can't remember, but I, re I remember trading him out and then having to trade him back in a week later to fit someone else in. It was Yuck. just it was just a comedy of errors. <laughs> Isn't that a sliding doors moment there where, like, uh, twinged his hammy or whatever it might have been or quad in Origin Camp, ahead of his debut. Yes. Misses out, Teddy comes in. Like, honestly, like, Sue Ali, uh, send off. Mm. Sue Ali doesn't get sent off. Blues could have won that game. Teddy probably kills it. Could have kept his spot. Had a remarkable year. You, every chance you didn't know Teddy at the time as well because you had Dylan Edwards. I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't. Teddy could have kept his spot. Played throughout Origin. Edwards doesn't play Origin. Stays in your team. Averages 100. Teddy owned a cell, whatever it might be. Just little moments. I know. Yeah. You don't want to look back on it, but it's hard not to. It, it is. It is. But <laughs> that's just the way the cookie yeah. crumbles. Uh, now, guys, <laughs> Patty from Mortgage Choice SCW, proud supporters of the podcast, not just this year, uh, but for about three or so years now, very loyal partners of the show. Guys, get in touch with them over the off-season, whenever the time suits you, whether it's education, whatever it might be, they can offer you just about anything, from working out your loan repayment, saving you money by getting you the best rate, getting into the housing market and you've got no idea where to start, give them a call, have a chat to them, work out where you are at with your finances, put a plan in place to get yourself to that position. Uh, debt consolidation, short-term loans, if you want to fund your trip to Vegas next season, they'll help you out with all that sort of stuff. So no matter when you speak to them, doesn't matter if you listen to this podcast, mention SC Playbook and you'll save $129 on that consultation. To do so, flick them a message on Instagram at mortgagechoice underscore SCW or give them a call on 02-9521-1611, no matter where in Australia you are based. All right, on to the big one, boys <coughs> and girl. What we learned <laughs> from the 2024 Supercoach season. Spy, <coughs> I'm going to start with you, and because I didn't talk to you pre-show about this, don't steal my big one around buy period and plotters. I, I won't mention buy period or plotters. You can me yeah, don't mention <laughs> buy period or plotters because that is what I want to talk I've about. I've got them in order, so we'll, we'll go through here and yep. I'll we'll wing this a little bit, guys. We will. In. We'll bounce off you. <clears throat> okay, number one, this is short and sharp. And we spoke about it during the season a bit, but I don't want to overanalyze matchups probably overly too much, especially the first two, three months of the year. I think early in the year, we sort of knew the Titans were struggling, so there was an opportunity mm. to get get amongst some points there. But realistically, most of the sides were somewhat okay. Um, I'm really going to save that matchup analysis for the back end of the year, post-origin. Mm. Sure, if a team pops up like the Titans early this year and they're struggling, you can have a crack at them, no worries. But I'm not going to worry about it too much. Penrith, I'm always going to worry about Penrith until they show me a reason not to. So I'm not going to necessarily bring in blokes and captain them against Penrith. And I might avoid Penrith matchups early. Do think the dogs will probably kick on and mm. keep their defensive resolve, especially early next year. So maybe there's one or two that I don't really want to play against. Mm. Outside of that, sure. There'll be some, some mind to like, there's some lesser sides, there's some better teams, but I don't think the gap's that large. I think that's um, a really yeah. good point, Spy. Probably something worked against me a little bit, uh, avoiding guys like Zach Lomax and uh, Jacob Kiraz, who, Jargon's doggies, everyone tips them to go low, <laughs> just probably didn't back them in and just <coughs> thought, is there any attacking upside there? There probably isn't. 
particularly, as you said, just the early stage of the season because, Matt, like, we see how even the, the NRL is. This season, there were upsets galore. Like, yep. I feel like we say this every year, but probably more than I've ever seen. Even in the back end of the year, there were enormous upsets. As you mentioned, you see the big scores that happens every year. You come out, basically, post-origin. Teams are injured, and we touch on this every year. But at the start of the year, when <coughs> squads are fit, the attack's a little bit clunky, you don't tend to see the big ones. When you say, like, the shift goes from not focusing on matchups to focusing on it, are you thinking, like, as soon as origin period hits and there's you do get restings around there, you do get players out due to origin, when do you think that, that shifts where you will start looking at fixtures again? Maybe around that origin period at times, but I also think you'll just see moments in the year you can just wait on and say, oh, they are decimated. Mm. They're in real strife the next couple of weeks. Then you can jump on and do that sort of stuff. I don't think it's wise necessarily just penciling around. Just just wait on it and organically it'll happen. Like we see it each year when sides are decimated. It might be earlier, could be later, but just wait. Like if, if you know your footy, you'll get an idea of when it's going to happen. I think the important one though is probably just the first two months of the competition. Eight weeks is a good yeah. good sort of guide to say everyone's up for it. And we know they're up for it, but I feel like in previous years you could match up a little bit. Mm. It's probably getting harder and harder because yeah. sides are getting closer and closer. And, yeah, I'm just going to not throw it out the window, as I said, but, yeah, there's going to be far less focus yep. on that. Start 2025, like run, to the, run to the top 10. Um, number two, already spoke about this a little bit, but I'm just going to hold that roulette as well. Um, tried to jump around fullbacks a little bit and stuff early. I genuinely did it as a bit of a trial this year just to see how it would go. It failed. Putting a, a spanner through fullback roulette? Early. Early. Just want to save it for late and forget fullback. I'm happy to rule that in the last, you know, eight, ten weeks, any position really. Yep. Uh, but I'm just going to rule that out early um, unless I really like someone or there's a reason to do it. Um, my big thing was I traded out eight people this year who just subsequently turned up that coming weekend, which is absurd. That's eight. It's probably, they weren't even tons. That's probably nearly a thousand points minus whatever my has scored <laughs> but yeah that's a lot of points and just doing that probably t takes me from six thousand to a thousand without even doing anything else yeah. so pretty fair difference um so rule it out the window early be wary of dropping someone too early exactly based on that the other thing i tried a little bit this year was really jumping between break evens just to see if it could give me some momentum in cash Whilst I did gain pretty good cash up to Origin, it cost me those big mm. scores. So I'm just going to really throw out break-evens next year uh, in those opening weeks. Not to say I won't use them. Like, clearly, if there's an easy trade to make and it's a heap of cash for a similar, similar bloke, sure. But I'm just going to be really wary about dropping some guys I know can hurt me. Um, and you, you mentioned, uh, <coughs> yeah, I think a Sunday, uh, we were chatting about, you know, lessons learned. Uh, sorry, Monday, the drive back from the Berra, the capital. And you mentioned Desi Creek, who Desi finished yeah. up around about 200. Massive, massive year from Desi. And Desi around break even had a bit of a different strategy. What did I say? Because I don't remember. I don't really remember <laughs> either. I was hoping you did. Desi. <laughs> is... I don't know. But either way, All right. it's more like if, for example, Ponga's 180. Oh, you know what it was? We were talking mm -hmm. about. Terrell May. I sold Terrell May before he we went bananas because I'd bought him at 420. He got to maybe 600. Then he dropped back to the bench yeah. and went to 550. And I remember clearly thinking, I don't want him to go back to 430. It means I've made no cash on him. I've already made the points. I've made my value. And you said, I'm going to hold him for origin because he could go bananas. I'm like, oh, it was almost like a pride trade. Just go, I've, I've, he's done my damage. Yeah. And he went bonkers after that. So... I think the fact that a bloke could lose $100,000 from 500 to 400K, it's not very much. It was, Desi said, opportunities tend to present themselves to make yes. cash elsewhere, uh, which is in my notes, would have got to it. Um, and, and around that, so you, you meant, have a chat about that. Yep, so you don't have to force your cash. I wouldn't have to be like, well, Pong is up. Let's try and make some money via uh, Jaden Campbell, who scored well last week, because then you'll, he'll make money, Pong will lose money. You'll find probably two weeks later, some bloke in the centres for the Dolphins might be worth 300k. He'll score 120 and go, I could grab him for three weeks. Don't even have to play him and he'll be worth 520k. That's one trade for $200,000. If he becomes a keeper, you keep him. You don't have to force it, I don't think. And, and it, I've probably learnt that this year a and bit. And it might be a position like 5'8", halfback, <clears throat> hooker, fullback possibly to a lesser degree where if you just 
the masses are going to an obvious trade in, but you don't have to do it, and you wait a week. That mass trade in it might not eventuate the way they want, but in the meantime, another one in that position has opened up that is better. And because everyone's gone to the you know player A instead of player mm. B a week later, you might have them to yourself. Yeah, like, literally by doing this, yes, you might cop a little price hit here and there, but every time you do it, you're saving trades. Mm to use on other things and yeah as i said like there's so many opportunities throughout the year like james schiller popped up he made us like three hundred thousand dollars. no one saw that coming but it's going to happen because wingers will score hat tricks then mm. you can roll off the back of it and then i think keep that core as good a squad as you can possibly get make money off the other guys so i really like that one yep. um this a lot of this will just tie in together but um just on a personal level i want to probably delve into stats a little bit more never thought i'd say that but i just tried to go a little bit that's like, a huge call from I know. Guy. <laughs> two kids have changed me i've got a bit less time but um mentally and physically <laughs> um <I> like that one <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> i think um there's certain stuff out there and the, the playbook will probably have it, as, have it as well next year where it's like I'm pretty sure this edge gets targeted. I just want to back that up with numbers just to make sure I'm right. Or maybe I've missed something. I watch every game, but I mean, I might have just missed something obvious that I haven't realised and gone, oh, that channel concedes more points than I realise. Okay, I'll jump on the back of that and do these sort of things. Or what I did find, certain defensive ed edges might be better than you realise throughout the season. Going, okay, maybe they're not as easy as it seems. So stuff around that, spend a bit extra time and resources just... Just getting my eye around stats um, to combine like my love of rugby league and my eye test with those numbers. Um, won't speak about number five. Won't speak about number six. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> um, saving trades for the last four or five weeks did not help me at all. But it could have. Like on another year, it could have. This year, it, I lost points from my last three trades, which is ridiculous because um, I got to the point, I'm like, I'm now forcing the three trades because I'm happy with my side. But again, on another year, it could have come up yeah. trumps. So Put it I'm, this way, yep. the, the <coughs> last four years, or three it been years, great. It would have, like, last year in particular, there was a ton of restings and injuries. This year... There was none. Like, <laughs> Not you, what you could have done with those three trades last year, but this year, I think <clears> because, I think I touched on it last week, but particularly there was teams up until about 12, 13, going into round 26... We're all playing for something. Yep. Top four, top eight, we're all alive. Yeah, was, and even in round 27, everyone was playing for yep. something. So the Storm were the only team who were in an easy position to rest. So they rested, mass rested in round 26. Yeah, and guess what I did? Sold Jerome Hughes. <laughs> and then, Jeez, I'm glad I saved yeah. that trade to get him out. And then round 27, <laughs> round 27, even like the outside of the Storm who'd sewn up the minor premiership, second through till 10th or 11th, it might have been 10th, all were playing for something. Everyone. So, so it just happened that yeah. way. So that's not so I don't want to have anything up the sleeve. I still think I'd want to have a couple, just emergencies, that sort of thing, a late move. Three three <coughs> with two rounds to go, as you said, could have been a master show. Yep. But three with two rounds to go, that's a lot. But I think it'll tie into if I want something to happen earlier in the season, whatever point it may might be, I'm happy to pull that mm. trigger and not worry too much about keeping five, six up the sleeve for those last six rounds. I think it is pretty viable to run from round 21 to 27, for example, with three, four trades and a deep squad. Yep. I'm, I'm perfectly happy with that. This year I tried to hold more. If I had two trades left with six rounds left and I was sitting 50th, I'd be like, sweet. I'll keep my depth, hold those two. Like, that's just a bit of, bit of a shift in thinking there. But that's sort of my main points outside of your ones. Like it. Clementine, you're well, just with your best. Well, mine kind of ties into that, actually. So my first one is don't be such a trade hoarder. Because, mm. like, definitely <laughs> I hoarded those trades. Um, and I think I was having a gentle gloat about it to Sky in <laughs> round 13 that I had all these boosts and all these trades. Um, gentle. And I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think it really backfired on me because my team wasn't set up that well for the buys at all. Um, I had a lot of players and I definitely had players every week, but they were the cheaper guys and they weren't the guys that were scoring the big mm. points and I didn't really plan for that very well. Um, and then coming out of that, I had all these trades and I just started willy-nilly using them, just like no forward planning. So forward planning is like definitely a big one I need to work on next year. Um, but like trading in like people like Hammer for a bunch of 40s, Joey Manu was my last trade in round 27, like for 40 points. Like, so I think definitely forward planning is another big thing I need to do and look at who can be scoring those big points, you know, down the line. You finished sixth and you, just, you got complacent. I really did. You this forgot year, didn't what I? got you to six, and that was research, study. You just you said hard work, mm. dedication, <laughs> attitude. 
Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Why did I come back from Queensland? I know, for this. <laughs> um, but then also, um, like just like you said, like trading up players like Blaze, like Tommy Talau and Galvin prematurely, and then they'd go and score these tons the next week. So I lost a lot of points that way as well. Um, and then also stubbornly holding on to these cheap hookers, like <clears throat> not thinking to myself, like, you know, there are points to be made at hooker um, and you can't just viably carry, you know, Danny Levi and Jaden Braley for the entire year. So that was another big one for me is just really try and spread up like, you know, how I'm doing my trades and just make sure the entire team is set up. Because I haven't even worked out how many points I lost yeah. on having those hookers. It would be a lot. It would be a lot of That patience. was a big one. Yeah. Like, you're somewhat, this is sugar coating, but somewhat fortunate that there weren't any real hookers who really took <coughs> off and averaged mm. up 75, 80, like we know Grant can do, Cookie, mm. that sort of thing. They all sort of plotted to harsh word, but sat around that 65 mark. But, yeah, it was a tough one. Yeah. So those were my biggest mm. learnings, I think. Yeah. Before I let you go, I'll mm. also mention that despite everything I just said, everything I tried could have come up trumps and I could have had my best year ever. Like, at the end of the day, some years things go your way, others they don't. That's just that's how footy goes in sport. Yeah, you sit there and you say, I did this wrong or I did this wrong or I did this wrong. <laughs> on any other year, it could have been Could have had on, strokes of genius. It wasn't. But you can only try to learn from your... But there's doing. definitely some good stuff there which I've genuinely yeah. taken. Yeah. Uh, one that I've genuinely taken in and my biggest run from this year that I reckon the large majority uh, of my issues arise from leading into the buy period. It might it might have been around 10 or 11. I'll, I'll get it up. But I was sitting okay at about 6 k. It might have been a little bit more higher. And every other year... I'm sitting around, you know, whether it's four, five, six K leading the buy period and I make big moves around there. Come out of the buy period, round sort of 19, 20, 21, and I'm like 1,000 or 2,000, a few trades up, so he's ready to go bang and make some moves. I went into the same this year and I went, this will be sweet, and I end up dropping a lot of positions. <clears throat> now, I think it was two years ago that they changed it to over the buy period, those three major buy just your top 13 players in your team score your points. I just didn't adapt to that well enough. Uh, now, I think I made a few moves there last year, but it was nothing dramatic compared to previous years. But I just focused on getting numbers on deck for those three major buy in particular. And what that led me to do was carry plotters. Plotters is the theme of my team this year. <laughs> and you mentioned earlier, Spy, that you didn't make many bad trades <coughs> of the year. And Guru and I just went through all my trades of the year and there weren't many bad ones. <clears throat> it was more about the ones that I didn't make and the blokes that I missed out on. And... Through the buy period, because they had coverage, I carried Morgan Smithies, Kai Pierce Paul, Sean Lane, these blokes who were never going to be keepers. They were never really going to do much damage. And I just went, you know what? There'll be an extra valuable 40 or 50 points on those major buy weeks with their coverage, with the upside of if they get some attacking stats, they can go 80 or they can go 90. They didn't. And then even around those buy periods, when you had injuries or things happened, and you might have been forced to play them, and they just did nothing. So Plotted made, out 45, you know, it's, yeah. it doesn't really help. And it just... Because someone worth 207k probably gets you 30. Yeah. 15 points exactly. and saves you all that extra cash for what you're about to say. Yeah, and just in the meantime, <coughs> people are getting bottomed out guns, and maybe they don't have as great buy coverage, or they're in the origin teams, but whatever. And I've just... And that was probably blokes like Kiraz or like Lomax just going bang, bang, bang. And I just missed them because I'm carrying dead weight in my team. So I just didn't adapt to the last two seasons, changes to that buy period. <coughs> uh, and look, when they bring in a major change like that in Supercoach, you know, you see how it plays out. You have to adapt. But yeah, I just got that one wrong. Like our mate Desi, who had a great year, we know the big fella. There's not a lot of buy plan that goes into it. And it worked remarkably for him. Uh, so I think there's, <coughs> there's something that – and it isn't to say that buy planning isn't important. It is, but just to approach it differently, if you end up with 11 or 12 plays instead of 13 on those three major buy-ins, I think that's absolutely fine because it, it probably means your squad's substantially stronger. Yep, so my one around that is – and we talked about it before – is I had blokes like Sean Lane, Pierce Paul. There are a couple in there, and by the time it got to the buyers, I was sort of hoping that improved and I was like, oh, they'll be ready to go. They'll be ready to step up. And they just, they did. They plotted mm. away. They didn't offer much. I could have got the same value out of a bottom price cheapie just coming up from, from Bush League or whatever. Um, what I do want to do, and I've never traditionally done this because we traditionally had to plan for 17 players over multiple weeks. I've got to get my head out of that, is just wait on the buyers. Have, you might check. You might have 
four or five blokes, then if you make six to eight trades around that sort of round 13 period, you can jump on everyone that's in form. Whereas previously I'd done it in advance and by the time it got to the buyers the last year or two, I've been like, they're not in form, I've got the wrong blokes, but it's too late. So the closer you can make those trades to the buy period, you figure out which teams are going well, which teams aren't, origin selections, go bang, 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 get all the guns. Um, so I'm going to really focus on that mm. next year about when I'm getting my buy players as close and, as possible. And this almost sounds stupid because it's so obvious, but it's easy to get detracted when you're focusing too much on buy planning. But I just want to go into next year going, basically want to bring in potential keepers, proven guns, whatever it might be, or people are going to generate plenty of cash. Not players who can do a job over the buy period, yep. who, are, who I know will not be potential keepers. Because if you can jag a couple of potential keepers in there who you don't have to trade out and they're banging out big scores. It might be Kiraz or whoever it might be. He might be an exceptional um, example, but it can just save your trades, better scores, <coughs> rather than, oh, this bloke plays the three major buy rounds and he might average me 55, which is solid, but I'm like, he could also plod to 45 or 50. I'm going to have to trade him out inevitably. That's what Then you get stuck playing him an extra game yeah, that you didn't exactly. plan to. You're like, oh, far out, I got this bloke. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah. Back to fundamentals. Yes, back, back to fundamentals. Back to basics. Uh, and to, yeah, so that was a big one. The other one that I think this was because I was probably chasing from a fair way out and I'd never really been in that position before, but for whatever reason, I just cast a little bit too much of an eye on ownerships, which I have never done. I have always been of the mindset of, I look at a player and he's if he's 60% owned uh, and he's compared to a 3% owned guy, I go, who do I think is going to score more on the run home? And I, I'll go, I'll pick that person. This year, I sort of went, oh, I've got some ground to make up. Going with X player, Jerome Hughes at 40% ownership, round 16 or whatever it is. I can't make up ground doing that, da, da, da. I just did it this year because I was trying to make up that ground. That cost me Zach Lomax. That cost me Jerome Hughes. Probably to a lesser degree, Jacob Kiraz. Uh, I think I, I veered from... There were reasons around it. It wasn't as dumb as it sounds, but I went Pappenhausen just before I think Tommy Turbo, just after Tommy had come back. It was a massive price difference. Tommy had a buy coming up, maybe a tough draw. And I was like, well, if I go Tommy and follow the crowd, that won't get me anywhere. Just dumb and I've never done that. So that player ownership stuff, just <clears throat> not ignore it. It's still relevant, but don't read into it too Don't much. do it for the sake of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and just the last one was, People saying like, you know, oh, I'm a bit too conservative in the way I play it. I wasn't, like I used four boosts by round nine. I used my last one after the buy period, uh, which I always plan to do. I still think that is the best way to use your last boost and I stand by that. The three trades I pulled that week were like Cherry Evans, Pappenhausen and someone who I think freed up cash. The idea was right. The execution was poor. Like, I just pulled the wrong reins. So I was like, yeah, I actually wasn't that conservative going against the highly owned players who were going really well um you know not probably swallowing my pride on like a kl Iro a little bit earlier that actually hurt me not going conservative yeah, so. yeah. that's true but yeah they're probably the big bad <coughs> ones for me i'll throw two in that are unrelated but brit nicker absolutely killed me <laughs> <laughs> he went from like struggling away a bit not at his best and i can't remember why i didn't buy him around origin period because mm. he was the perfect buy there was some reason back then I didn't do it. Whether it was the ownership thing or Nico was in and out, I was like, oh, let's just go against him. He averaged like 80 plus for the last 16 mm. weeks and just decimated me. We missed a lot of the that last game on Sunday because Sam was playing. Looked up I'm like, Nico, 129. Of course he freaking did. <laughs> I'm like, oh, God <laughs> Two damn late tries. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, the Ruben Garrett curse. We've got to make a decision next year of whether I just bring in Rubes to start and hold all year. Or avoid because um, I think he's well. It's not Manu esque. It is. It's not there. my friend Rubes. We can't quite nail it together. I'll tell so you what is getting Manu esque. That's Dom Young to Desi Creek. Holy, it, that Manu. is up there. Yeah, <laughs> Dom Young. I can cost Desi probably top fifty this year. Yep. Uh, Maddie, from a, a relative uh, a rookie perspective, uh, mate. Any big takes from the year uh, as you build into the game? The big one for me is I. I was kind of caught between planning long-term and not planning long-term and like the way I it's it's kind of hard to explain but like I wouldn't plan for the whole year but then in like round seven I wouldn't bring someone in because they're going to play origin in a few weeks and then I'd miss I'd miss like three or four weeks mm. of points um so I was, I was kind of looking a bit 
a bit too long-sighted and a bit too short-sighted at the same time. I, <coughs> it's not that I just didn't plan or it's not like I planned too much. It was kind of like an awkward mix, <laughs> awkward mix in between. So I guess next year be more willing to, you know, do more risky trades or put in more origin players, for example, uh, before the origin period, but also just have a general outlook of the year and more, m- more specifically the, the buy periods, yeah. uh, which I just didn't plan for at all. Yeah, which you have to, and yeah, like you said, like a, <coughs> maybe like around eight or something, you're four or five weeks out from origin, uh, but Tommy Trebojevic does have a really soft run and you're going, well, he's going to play origin, he might get rested, I won't touch him. That's exactly and what I did, And then he goes, yeah. 130, 130, 130, 130. Yeah, so being willing to, to kind of pull the trigger on that is a big takeaway for That's me. a good one, hey, and it probably revolves around buys a bit as well. It's like, oh, he's got to buy in a few weeks. I'm like, yeah, we could score. 200 twice before yeah. then just mm. don't worry me don't worry about it too much yeah mm. yep. do you reckon question for maddie yep and it's you're not looking for excuses obviously but south season and the emotional turmoil had to have hurt you <laughs> hard to do both you know what it actually didn't because mm. they were so bad so early oh you knew early so like yep. i didn't just i just didn't bring anyone in because <laughs> like if they were all right up, up mm. until round eight i might have brought some people in but the only one I really held on to was, was Cody Walker yep. all year. And, and I, he went I, okay. He went all right and yep. he was cheap when I got him. So uh, there was no real South regret yeah, for me enough. this year. Tell you what, there'll be a few very cheap Rabbitohs Ooh, players yeah. to start next year. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You could own 14 of them. I think, I think I'm going to be – I think I'm going to be Wayne Bennett. I'll own the whole team. <laughs> uh, now, let's – we've gone for a while. It's been a long season. So we'll touch on this one a bit quicker than I anticipated, but just a few potential rule changes oh, yeah. that we wouldn't mind for 2025. We can keep it short, we can keep it sharp, but just to get the uh, get the debate flowing in the comment section. My one's easy and it's going to be pretty short. Bang on about it all the time, but 18th man. Yeah. I actually want an 18th, 19th, 20th. That's what English Premier League does. I just signed up to NFL because why not? Mm-hmm. And they have a auto for every position if someone's out. So, for example, I'm a casual NFL player, right? Christian McCaffrey was out today, I found out at lunch. There's no way I'm checking sides. <laughs> so I got some boat came in. I'm like, because it's fair, I didn't just get one off my worst score. There's going to be plenty of people out there who don't want to check team lists and that every week. And the other thing is, right, if someone gets ruled out and it's Thursday night, you can go, sweet, I'll sub someone in. If someone gets ruled out last game on Sunday, you could have had six guns that you've earned, built the depth that you could have brought in. You're like, I cannot do anything. So just pick an 18th, 19th, 20th. They just come in as required if someone's out. That just makes sense, doesn't it? What's the holes around that? It makes complete sense. And everyone, myself included, <coughs> blowing up about like HIAs that happen to players, injuries that happen to players. And you just go, it just becomes a, a lot of luck involved. And for the record, I'm not blaming that for my bad rank this year at all. Like I didn't have it any worse than anyone else. But it just takes that luck out or lack of fortune, I should say, out of the game. As you said, and it rewards people that, all right, you know, they've got a decent 18th, 90th and 20th men. <coughs> all goes to plan. Is how you do it, Spy, would it be purely based around ins and outs? Or I don't mind the idea, and I sort of had, I like, don't mind the idea of like what they do where you have 18th, 90th, 20th, and you select them. You go, this is my first reserve, yep, my second, locked reserve, in. my third. And again, there are a little bit of tricks and trades and, and the way to go around it. But initially I just had 18 man squad, your top 17 scorers in it, uh, score so then if you have your third minute HIA or your seventh minute hamstring go whatever it is and that person scores your five points they become your lowest score drop out and then you have your top 17 just something like that it's pretty simple <coughs> yep. so for me um, the no brainer aspect is if someone's ruled out over the weekend you just get your next man up that you've selected in order you can't just choose the bloke who scored 140 you didn't choose him but as long as, as long as you've selected them again there might be some little ins and outs there could be a loophole but I don't care Loopholes are fun if you're good enough mm. to do it, whatever. Um, it saves so many headaches and so many blow-ups. It's and good for depth builders and people that love it, and it's good for casuals who just want to – because I know for a fact if, I, if I'm if i doing NFL, for example, and I lose three guys and I get nothing, I'm not going to keep playing. I'm like, ah, oh, bugger this for a joke. I don't care. If you're a casual NRL player, we want to keep people in the game. You go, oh, cool, I'll get to watch this guy on Sunday – Cool, I'll turn on the doggies match and watch. Who's this? Kiraz. Oh, he's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Can't I put him as 18th? But, like, it's good for all parties, I think. In relation to the HIA and injuries, I really think – I don't know, probably a little bit harder to do, but I think there should be some sort of minute cut off for, like, maybe it's the first 30 minutes. If you lose a bike inside 30 minutes of the game, just you just get your feeling. See, that's where I feel the idea of having, you know, your squad of 20, your top 17 scorers do it, or, like – 
I had 18 jotted down. Yeah, 18. And then if someone does get the HA and they're your lowest scorer, that just drops out and you get your top 17. It just covers it so well. Just a real basic low score HA. Whereas if they'd scored, what, 46 it, in it, 23 it, yeah. minutes, just they it just, just leave takes, it? Yeah, that's like just, so, just someone might 44. score three tries in 27 minutes and be on 100. Yeah. Uh, and then they get HA, like Dom Young. I know there's exception yeah, yeah. to the rule, but Dom Young against the Warriors <coughs> that day, where he was on 120 after. People were like, no, no, I want his score. I was like, yep. And it allowed that to You're happen. You're not losing that. You're losing the bloke who's your lowest score yep. of the week due to that injury, HA. Someone mentioned, oh, what if you get hooked and stuff? I don't really care. Just if you got hooked and you happen to get the lowest scorer, bit of luck, yeah. good on you. But like, just make it really basic. Mm. Yeah, if they're the, the lowest scorer in your squad, if you're starting line up, drops out. Drops out. Love it. Mm. Well done. Anything to add, Clem? Rule changes? Mine's just short and sweet. I don't actually know how this one would work, but like, it would be cool if there was like some points for like big defensive plays. Like if there was a massively obvious try saver or something, and like if they got some points <coughs> as well. It, I know it's it's a hard one because like it could be quite subjective a lot of the time. I know, but you know, surely that should be worth something. It's you're spot on. There should be something, but it is so subjective. <laughs> Like when people, you know, you get held up in goal now, which is plus three, but there could be four blokes involved in some mad try saving tackle. Yeah. Who gets points, who doesn't? It's, I'm with you. You told me the other night how you fix it. Do you remember what it was? Well, like if like the fullback. There's a one on one tackle. For example, one on one cover defence. And it's him and he's definitely saved mm. that try. If there's no one behind him, like it's just. Yeah, that's try just saver. literally a try saver, right? Yeah. Like, so. And then it'd just... Or cover defence, yeah. like could be a back rower coming so across. So the, what that'd obviously do is it'd inflate fullback scoring. So they just benefit, I guess. Yeah, there's probably some cover defenders as well that would get some. Yeah, but um, like fullbacks are going to get fullbacks three get more. of those a game. Um, but I think you probably also add in what we spoke about and it's um, if you get if you make 40 tackles in a game, you get an extra five or ten points. Mm. 50 tackles is 15, whatever it may be. I, I would like... Reward some work rate. I would like them to re reward work rate a bit <coughs> more just to balance that gap between... Front row forward's boring at the moment. 2RF, <coughs> 2RF's okay, hooker's okay, but if they just rewarded the workhorses, like the most important part of a rugby league team, the workhorses, well, not necessarily, but a vital part of it, important... Someone might pay up for a front row and it becomes a more important position rather than focusing on it. It has to be your cash spend at fullback or fullback. <coughs> Imagine how diverse teams would be at the start of the year if they could bridge that gap between fullback and halfbacks to front rows and hookers sort of thing. Because you, you, you'd have to work out where do you spend your funds rather than knowing where you're going to spend it. And in terms day. of watching games, like this is way back in the heyday mm. of Gallon and Corey Parker and co, you could be watching a game, right? Say you got an extra 10 points if you made 40 tackles mm. in a game. You'd be up to 37 tackles, five to go. You're like, get in there. Yeah, get in there. Like, it'd be fun. And if you're up to 50, which 50 is very good. So I'd be happy for an extra, maybe it's five points for 40 tackles and an additional 10 for 50 tackles. Mm -hmm. You're like, 48 tackles, two to make. Come on, come yeah. on. 50 tackles, you yeah. beauty. You're like, how good would that be late in games? Yeah. Um, I, no, I really like yeah, it. Yeah. Um, that being said, we've said it before. We are, and it's the reason why we play Supercoach over Fantasy. They run a. They run a great game. The scoring system Bloody is all really good. I love the Vastro. We're just nitpicking, but I do think they're pretty easy challenges. The only one I feel great. strongly about is that. Yeah, the yeah eighth, agreed. The uh, selected bench. Lucky last, never again list. Is there anyone? I'll start. Morgan Smithies, <laughs> never come near my side again. I respect you as a bloke. I respect you as a workhorse who just gets everything out of his ability that he can. Played a good role for the Raiders this year, but I've never met a bloke with less attacking ability in my life. Spy. I don't have anyone. Mm. Yeah. There's no one this year I went never again, so that's something. Clem? Yeah, all my cheap fuckers, like never again. <laughs> all You're of them. dead to me. Like I'm high class fuckers all the way now. Um, so, <laughs> but everyone knows I'm bringing back cheese as soon as I can. Yeah. <laughs> Except for cheese. <laughs> as soon as he's back next year. Would you class cheese as a high class hooker? He's a cheap hooker. <laughs> or is he both, depending on the day? Oh, I don't know. Is yeah. he a, he's a mid level hooker? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he was a high class hooker back in his day and he's just lost his way a bit. But he can yeah. be back. Yeah. He can be back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's wrap that up for the Reflection podcast for the season. We will be back next week with the Supercoach Award Ceremony, the team of the year, the MVP, all that good stuff. Spite, thank you, mate. Cheers, legends. Glenn? It's been a pleasure. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next week.